other things. All right, one thing I want to say, there's a job fair on Thursday. It's virtual. You tune in with Zoom. So you, as before, the people we usually have will be there. So uh, if you're looking for a job, I recommend tuning in. I'm not going to cancel my Thursday class. If I had more warning, I might have. But you can just watch the video later if you want to stay out with the employers. If any of you are looking for a job, check it out. Not that I'm looking, but I'm curious. Yeah. Is anybody hiring anybody over the age of 50? Oh, very likely. And some of these are, in fact, volunteer positions. Um, and so, and a lot of people, even if they're not ready for a job, they attend to hear the pitches. Each employer will make a pitch and explain what they want and what they're looking for. And from that, you can get a clue, like what's worth studying, what would get you a job and stuff. I know you got a job at one of these things. Uh, yeah. I, I was at the Housing Authority yeah, yeah. for about a year, but I, then, I, uh, then I ended up working at a full-time gig. So I couldn't... Um, even better. That's uh, the whole point. <laughs> uh, but it's not in IT, but... I'm, yeah. getting, I'm trying to, I'm working my way towards it. That's why I'm here taking your classes yeah. now. Okay, but still, it's great. Anyway, um, so they, these are the employers he's going to have, which are a lot of people that employ our students every time. And it's, they give, each give a brief presentation, and then they have their own little Zoom breakout room where you can talk to them. So you might want to tune into this if you're interested in the job market, and especially if you're looking for a job. Well, no, no. This is, what this is, is their public-facing educational museum kind of thing. A lot of it. And some of it is just maintaining the, uh, the tech, IT, um, they have a whole bunch of different positions. Some of it is just like desktop support to clean set machines and stuff. They have like 10 positions. It's highly sought after too because it pays and people really like the environment. A lot of our students have gone there and been very happy. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think working for the National Labs is great. Oh yeah, but this is, this is their public facing, you know, sort of museum part. Uh, it's not the classified stuff. <laughs> Although, I guess it might lead to that once you're in. If that's up. Yeah. All right. Anyway, so now I want to talk about this class. Um, I, my demos have been falling behind. I looked at the time schedule today, and so the projects I was going to demonstrate today were due today, so I delayed some due dates. Because what happened, I think, is I had trouble with my uh, cloud machine, so I didn't get demos up to speed. So I moved the projects that were due today to next week, and the ones due to next week to the week after that. This was when a guest speaker was going to come, but in fact, there is not going to be a guest speaker then. So I'm just going to do more demos and no lecture then to get us caught up so we can uh, get the demos ahead here. So that's the plan. So if you've been uh, feeling like you're late on these projects, it's okay. I moved them out by a week. Does CCSF track its students who enter that program? Um, unfortunately, we don't. It would sure be nice if we could know which students get a job. Now, the ones that get them right from our job fair, I think Steve Nelson will know. But unfortunately, we don't know what jobs our students ultimately get or how many of them get jobs, which is a real drag for our... Um, are uh, people who try to fund things. Well, people say the video is blurry, but I think there's nothing I can do. There's only one network to join. And uh, let me see what the speed is like. I don't think I can do much about it. It was really fast last time. Yeah, it's pretty fast now. So, yep, see what you can do. Uh, I, I think, and it says green here. I think it's, at this end, it appears to be good. But anyway, um, let me know if it gets worse or if something happens to the sound because I need that information. I can't uh, tell what you people are seeing unless you tell me. All right. So anyway, now we're going to start talking about debugging. And uh, I got a couple of projects to play with the debugger. So let me put this on the right screen. All right. So disassemblers take your executable code and they make, um, they print out the assembly code, display it so you can see the instructions and read them. And that is the hard way to do it, and we're not going to do that yet. That's what Ida Pro does. Debuggers run the program and let you see what's happening. Every memory location and every register and every function and every argument, and you can stop it at any point during processing and change those values. So it is a lot like dynamic analysis of malware. You're running the program and examining what happens while it goes. And that's a lot easier. There's two debuggers we're going to talk about a lot in this class. Ollie debug, um, which the later version of this is called immunity, which is essentially the same thing. Um, this is the most popular one. This is used by, uh, win by script kiddies to cheat on Windows games for years. It makes it really easy to see what's inside Windows programs and modify them. And it's the one limitation of this one is it only does user mode debugging. It's only for user applications like games and Microsoft Word and stuff. It is not for debugging the kernel in the heart of Windows. 
It's used for debugging applications, which is usually what you want to do. And this is what we're going to do mostly. But we will use WinDebug a little bit, which is much harder to use and more confusing, but it's much more powerful, and you can debug the kernel. This is the internal Microsoft product used to debug Windows when you're writing Windows and device drivers and stuff. And so it's important, and we will cover it, but we're starting with the easier product, OllieDebug. There's two kinds of debuggers in the world. In the computer science department, where you actually learn real programming, you use source level debuggers. And these are what's built into platforms like Visual Studio, that professionals use to write code. You can run your code and, um, uh, and work at a source level. You'll see your, your original source code. What's the uh, Linux version of Ollie Debug? I think it's x64 debug and x32 debug. Um, you can debug. And what offer what I use, well, there's still Windows. And what I use is GDB. We're using it a lot in the exploit development class. Uh, GDB is the command is a command line debugger that you use on Linux. And there are a bunch of ways to put a graphical face on it, all of which seem misbegotten to me, and I just use the command line GDB. But that's that's the main one. All right. Anyway, so you can put uh, breakpoints on your lines of code and step through the program one line at a time and see the variables, but you never touch assembler in a source level debugger. If you're writing Python, you just run through your Python code and Python statements. You know, developers just want to stay in the one language they're using. Assembly level debuggers is considered very difficult and confusing and only malware analysts would do it because real developers have the source code and it's much easier to work at the source code level. But this is what we're going to do using assembly code. Um, there are a few ASM projects for GDB. Yes, there are, yeah. There are a bunch of things based on GDB that, that try to decorate it and make it more like Ollie. Um, I haven't found one I like. Other people like some of them. There's also something called Radar A2, which a lot of people like, which is a more advanced debugger for Linux. But GDB works as far as I'm concerned. So when an app crashes in Windows, you might see this box pop up. Back in the old days, you'd see a Dr. Watson or something pop up. Now you see you can your program has stopped working. Would you like to debug it? If you have a debugger installed, it will offer. Usually, it'll try open it in WinDebug. Normal people don't want to do this. But if you have this, you can get a little bit of information. Here's the module that faulted. Here's an exception code, an exception offset. Not much readable information, but you could open it in WinDebug. And that's, of course, uh, one option. Anyway, um, so kernel versus user mode. User mode debugging is the most common. You just run the debugger just like any other application on your one computer. You analyze the program. That's all you do. You debug one executable at a time. That's it. And you're separated from other executables. Um, so it's simple and clean. You debug one thing like a game or one piece of malware. In kernel mode debugging, the problem is the kernel is the heart of the operating system. It must always be in RAM. It has to always be running when the machine is up. So if you were to put a breakpoint on the kernel and stop it, your machine would stop dead. So you can't debug a computer alone. You have to have a second computer connected to it. And for, until very recently, the only way to do it was with an old serial 25-pin cable, which does not even exist on most modern hardware. But you would connect those two machines together. One would be like the master and one the slave. You would debug this kernel, and the other one would control it. That was the old way. Now, around Windows 8, Microsoft finally let you connect them through the Ethernet port or through USB or something, other ports that actually exist. But even that was pretty much a drag. But this is what you must do if you really want to debug the kernel with full features. If you want to have breakpoints in the kernel and stop it, then you have to have a second computer <laughs> connected to it to do that. Although, you can do it with virtual machines. All, and that's why students used to do it, and it was really quite painful and buggy to set up because you had to configure virtual serial adapters that went between them, and they didn't work all that well. But Mark Rasinovich saved the world here for us, like many other ways. Mark Rasinovich is an amazing guy, um, and he rated Belgers so you can do this. But here's, by the way, it used to look, it still does, you have to go into startup and turn on debugging mode. So your computer is prepared to be controlled by another computer and allow you to debug the kernel. And one, yeah. Can you, can you still do that today? Yes. In server 2019? Yes, but you do, you do it with BCD Edit. And we will do it in the projects. Okay. <coughs> yeah. um, and by the way, if you turn on debug mode, then the sysrq key will cause the blue screen of death. And it's the same thing as the print screen key. So this really p hurt my poor students trying to learn in the lab because they try to take screenshots of their projects and it would blue screen the machine after they turned this on. So. Anyway, um, your last spoil have uh, safe mode. I haven't seen yeah. safe mode in ten years. It does exist, but it's not used that commonly. 
Yeah, it used to happen all the time. Oh, Vista. yeah. Vista was run in safe mode. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That yeah. was brutal. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I mentioned Mark Vrcinovich. Mark Vrcinovich ran a company called Sys Internals, which Microsoft bought. He is an amazing guy. He writes spy thrillers like James Bond. He basically lives the life of that guy, flying around the world in jet sets and, and fancy clothes. And he's incredibly brilliant. He knows Windows better than anything. He's had a standing offer to just clean malware off anybody's machine anytime because it's so easy for him. He's the guy that found the Sony root kit. When you played the Sony CDs about 15 years ago, it would put a mark on your machine so you couldn't play it on another machine. And he did that with a root kit. And to him, this is as obvious as a fly landing on the screen. Wait, that's a root kit. And they shouldn't use that. He can just tell. He read all these tools to look inside Windows and see exactly what's happening. And he totally understands everything. So he figured out how to fix this. If, if you have a crash dump, if your machine crashes with a blue screen of death um, and you configure it to prepare for this, it will save a copy of the contents of memory. And you can then email that to Microsoft if you pay for a service contract like corporations do, and they will open it at Microsoft and figure out what the problem is and send you a custom patch to fix your machine. And this is what most of Microsoft knowledge base articles are, is basically the history of problems. If this happens, here's the patch. And um, so what he figured out is he made a software patch that will make the live memory look like a file by just adding a header so he can connect WinDebug to a fake header to the live kernel and it thinks it's looking at a crash dump. So you can now view the kernel on one machine. Now you can't make a breakpoint and stop it, but you can view it and that's what we're going to do. So this is, we made this thing called Live KD and it's bloody awesome and now it's built into WinDebug to view the kernel on this one machine. So it's nice. It's still pretty hard to use, but it's better than it used to be, and you no longer need to try to connect two machines with an obsolete cable or simulate that, which caused previous generations of my students to suffer greatly. WinDebug is currently in Windows 10 and 11? Uh, you have to download it separately, but it's a Microsoft product, and it's available for every version of Windows. Yeah, and we'll use it. Yeah, it's not included by default because normal people don't want to do this, but it is a free product for Microsoft. And by the way, um, I wrote my whole exploit development class after I saw this presentation from Joe McRae, who is fantastic, explaining how to do exploit development for mere mortals. And exploit development was considered very difficult, writing attacks, like basically writing your own malware. But he made it look easy enough, and he did it with Ollie Debug, and I learned a lot about Ollie Debug. So that's a fun video to watch if you like, although we're pretty much going through it in the, uh, in the modern class. Yeah, we will only, we'll be using uh, probably Windows 10 or 11, or server 2016 or 2019. Any of them will be fine for what we're doing here. Yeah, all right. Anyway, let's try a Kahoot. I should have them open somewhere. Let's see. Uh, they're here. All right, no, that's not them. Thought that's Twitch. Well, I'll open them up again. Somehow I lost them. Google. All right. Well, that's not what I wanted. There we are. All right. This is 126.8a.
Just because I got a cataract, I got the light coming from an angle fogs up my vision. They tell me I shouldn't get the surgery yet. One of my friends is getting the surgery next week. No, the time will come. I'm just obeying what they tell me. They say it's not bad enough yet, and I say, well, you know. I had cancer. I'm not arguing with my doctors. I do what they tell me. It works. I'm fine now. But I don't argue with them. <laughs> I pretty much go along with what they say. I know. I know. I was very lucky. Got it early. Cut it out. It was gone. Very nice. How long was this then? About eight, eight months. Oh, yeah. I, they got it early. It wasn't a big deal. I'm a very lucky man. <laughs> Lucky, sir. Yeah, I know. All right, so Bush Technique requires two computers connected together. That's kernel mode debugging. There you go. All right. All right, what technique is almost never used by malware analysis? source level, because you don't have the source code. Generally, of course, they don't hand that out. There's a few hilarious examples of malware that came out with the source code with symbols in it, and everybody sneered at them, and it was easily analyzed. But normally, they strip that out before they ship it off. All right, so what technique displays assembly code but doesn't let you run it? Yep, that's disassembly. All right. And if a crash causes the blue screen of death, how do you debug it? kernel mode debugging, the blue screen of death is what happens when the kernel encounters an exception. The program cannot continue. This just, that's why the whole thing stops, because if the kernel stops, your computer won't do anything. Whereas if something in user mode stops, the rest of the computer is still running, so it just pops up a box saying, I'm sorry, Microsoft Word crashed or something. But you can't do that with kernel exceptions. The machine is just dead, so it pops up the blue screen and you have to restart. And you can do a kernel mode debugging to find out what went wrong on the crash dump. So, all right, Karen. So, let's go back to here. All right, so, uh, so to use your debugger. Um, now, there's two ways. The most common way. You start the debugger and you open the program in the, in, you're, you're analyzing in the debugger. This way it hasn't run at all. It loads it and stops execution before it begins running so you can see the situation. And then you can step forward in the debugger. Another thing you can do though, if you want to debug a service or something that's already running, you can connect to an already running process in the debugger and then it'll pause the threads and you can see what's happening. This is another way to do it. This is not the most common. Usually you do it this way. Um, so sing, you can single step through the code. You can just go step, step, step through the assembly language instructions, and that's fine. But the problem is, of course, it might be thousands of assembly language instructions to get to the interesting part. So usually you zero in on the interesting part and then single step around there if you're going to do single steps. It's very easy to get bogged down in details and spend hours analyzing something that ultimately turns out to be totally boring, like it's just loading the libraries to get it going or something. Um, you, you have to learn how to spot the interesting part. Which is why these cursory techniques we talked about before are so useful, like looking at strings. What's going on here? What's going on here? What's going on here? Well, this is the interesting part. Then you're, uh, I've heard it compared to like a jigsaw puzzle. You're trying to put together a jigsaw puzzle with a thousand pieces, and you just find the corners. And then you find the one distinctive thing. And that's really all you want. You don't really want to understand everything. You just want to know a few things, like what did it do? How do I clean it off? You don't need to know every bit of the code. So here's an example. Here's code which loads um, 
into EDI, a number it got from memory, and then um, it loads into ECX something here, which I think is probably the length of the string, and then it does exclusive OR of the data pointed here and then increments it. So it's going to exclusive OR every byte. This is a simple encryption routine. And this loop W, I, th I couldn't look at, find it in x86 instruction set, clear definition, but I think what this does is just loop and automatically decrement ECX and only loop until it hits zero. So this will go through all 13, uh, D is 13 a hex. This will go through the 13 characters in a string. And that's what you see here. It's decrypting this, um, this load library A. And so this is the assembly code to do a simple kind of decryption, just static um, uh, XOR, where you XOR every character, which is a simple way to scramble data. And yeah, you did win, Ruhani. All right. So anyway, that's what you'll see. And so you might single step through it because it's it's, you'll see it decrypting step by step. It's a nice way to see what's going on. And we talk about this. Now, when, you, when you're going through code, you can do single step. That will just go to the next one instruction. But then what if the next instruction is a call? that calls a subroutine. Now you have two choices. You could step into, which will again do just one step, which will take you into the subroutine, and now you can single step through there. Now this might seem like the best thing to do, but in fact you very often want to step over because the problem is you're looking at the code the developer wrote, which is in a high level language like C, and then the routines they wrote, but everything they do is ultimately going to make Windows API calls and go into the Windows kernel and do things. And unless you are trying to debug the Microsoft Windows kernel, you don't want to waste your time in that. And that is really where most of the execution takes place. You, you make a few commands, you call a routine, then you send a house instructions down here in the routine, then you go back here. You just want to stay at the high level, up at the source code written by the developer. So you, in that case, you would step over. What step over does is it calls and runs until it returns and then resumes back to you. So you don't stop at any more instructions until you find another instruction at this level, which is often what you want. Now the problem is, if you step over, then you don't see what happens inside there, and maybe what happens inside there is important, and maybe whatever happens inside there will cause it to never return, and it'll never come back to you, so that's an issue. But that's how I understand that these is important. If you just do step into, you will quickly just end up lost in the Microsoft operating system. <laughs> where it's, you probably don't want to be, because normally you're trying to debug the user land code that somebody wrote. If you step over a call, do you need to uh, populate uh, data fields that, that the routine is expecting to return? No, if, if you haven't been changing them, it will have all the data fields that the program put there. If you start the program at the beginning, and you run it up to the call, and when you step over, it will just run. It'll, it's really running as expected. Unless you jump over things or change the value of those routines, a program running in a debugger duplicates its function outside the debugger. Mm -hmm. The only difference is it lets you stop things. It lets so you data dependencies aren't going to stop? No. All the data will load as normal. It will do everything. We'll try it later. It runs completely like normal, except a little bit slower, which is what you want, of course. You can run it unmodified, and then you can try modifying it and putting breakpoints in it. Step it into run slower, right? What's that? It usually it will run slower yeah, it because it's well yeah because it's actually what it's doing is running Python code the debuggers are in Python and the Python code is inspecting it to decide if it's time to break or not so things are a little slower in a debugger ah. it's not too bad though so when you stop when you have a breakpoint they call it broken it, it stopped so now for example here you might have code where it loads it calculates something and puts it in ECX then it, it takes um, some data from here and puts it in EAX, then it calls that. So now I'm calling a subroutine, but the address depends on the value of these registers, and I don't know what it is. So you don't know where it goes, so you put a breakpoint here, and then look and see what EAX is. That's one of the many cases you'd run, it, run to this point, and then you'd find out what EAX is. Um, here's another one. This one here creates a file name. See, it's creating something, adding a .txt to it here. So somehow it's creating a file, and then uh, it's going to call Microsoft create file W. And so if this was a disassembler, you would have to read all this and understand it to figure out what's going on. But since it's a debugger, you don't have to. When it makes this call to Microsoft create file API, it must have the file name. So if you just put a breakpoint here and let it run to that point, you can look on the stack and find these, these parameters and one of them will be the file name. So this is what you often do. I've done this with PHP malware and everything. If you run a complicated thing, let the malware do it for you. 
put a breakpoint, it will untangle this crap, then you see the results. The only problem is if you miss, which I've also done, and break it at the wrong point, then the malware performs some of its malicious activities before you examine it. So that's why you always want to work in a disposable virtual machine anytime you're working with malware. It is very easy to accidentally run the malicious part when you thought you were in control. So, um, and it could happen at any time, right? Yeah, and even tools like, Lord, like this uh, PE view and PEID that are just supposed to be examining the file, sometimes they run it. So that's why you've got to work in a clean environment. It's like working with a live virus. You should be in a clean, sterile environment. Don't do it on a machine you know and love with your credit card numbers and emails on it. <laughs> you know, you, you, you're working with malware. So, All right, so WinDebug looks like this. This is something Microsoft did a lot of times that really annoyed me. It's a command line tool. You have to type in command line commands, but then they put it in a window just to make you crazy. <laughs> And so you have to put all the commands down here, then it puts them up there, and the windows are sort of clumsy and hard to scroll around. And I think they should have just left it in the DOS command line as far as I'm concerned. And you do have to learn all the command line commands, which are very far from obvious. You cannot choose them off a menu. It's very powerful once you learn how to use it. And there are scripts that will do awesome things, but for beginners, it's pretty painful. So here you do put a breakpoint at the create file W, which is the uh, same thing we were just looking at. They put a breakpoint at the Microsoft system call that will create a file. Then G is go. So now it runs, it hits the breakpoint, and here it prints out the condition of the machine. Here's the registers, EAX, EBX, ECX. And here is um, uh, more stuff. And then you, so it looks in here, and it figures out somehow that ESP plus four, oh, it's gonna dump, now it's gonna dump data from the location ESP plus four, and there it is, log file text. This is the file name when it's creating a file. So you can do it in WinDebug. It's a lot easier to do in uh, at Ollie or um, uh, Immunity, Ollie Debug. All right, so here's another one. For example, suppose malware encrypts data and sends it over the internet, like your browser does. They encrypt stuff with HTTPS. Um, Decrypting it from the encrypted network data is hard, so what you do is you just find the call that encrypts the data and break it there and look at the data before it gets encrypted. That's, so that's, once you have the access to the actual program, all you have to do is be able to find these important points, like where it's decrypted, where the string is constructed, where the file is made, and then you can find out um, what's going on. All right, so here's Ollie Debug. It's got four main panes. This one here shows you the assembly code that's running. Um, and the most important thing is down here in the corner, it's paused. When you first load a program, it loads and it stops. It's not running, it's paused. Now you can run it with the run button here, but it pauses so you can see it. This is the code that's about to run. There's the assembly code. If you look on the right, it will have human readable things. These are Windows API calls, get version EX, get module in something or other. Fairly understandable stuff is over here on the right. So you can get oriented just by looking at that and not even bother reading the assembly code. This is the assembly code. This is the hexadecimal instructions right there, and here's the address of them. So you can see it at all different levels of complexity. But the easiest part is, of course, here. You just see readable, readable stuff. I think we have an earthquake. An earthquake? Yeah, I felt some shaking. That screen is going Oh, yeah, to yeah, yeah, a little bit of shaking, yeah. It could, yep, not a bad one, though. No. Anyway, then over here you see the registers, EAX, EBX, ECX, and so on. And down here is the stack. These are words on the stack pointing to things. And this is just an area where you can dump any, in hexa, hexadecimal, any region of memory you want to examine it. So that's the layout of Ollie Debug, and it's quite fun and friendly to use, and we'll spend quite a lot of projects playing with Ollie. So there are two kinds of breakpoints. Well, three kinds. Software, hardware, and conditional. Yeah. Go ahead. Why is the screen shaking? Yeah, it's still doing it. I don't know. Good question. Projector is vibrating up there. I, would, I suspect you're right that the whole building is vibrating a little bit. Oh, okay. All right. Anyway, so um, the normal breakpoint is a software execution breakpoint. And the way it does it is it just overwrites a byte of the instruction. So if the code is like this, it broke here. This 6A in memory is not really a 6A. It's lying to you. It overwrote it with a CC, which is a break. So the actual code in memory contains a CC, which has created a int3 exception, which is what went to the debugger. So then the debugger lied to you and said, well, that should be a 6A. That's what I'll put there when you're done with this breakpoint. When you hit run, I'll put the 6A in there and resume. So that's how debuggers work. 
They just patch the code by adding a breakpoint instruction wherever you put a breakpoint. And that means that the actual memory image of the program is not exactly right while it's running in a debugger, where the breakpoints are. So that's the point. And therefore, when it hits that, that part, instead of executing the original instruction, it generates an exception, which the debugger catches. And somebody else says, yeah, anyway, so, all right. So there's a, here you put, um, so here's an example. You want to put a breakpoint at push EBP. The disassembly view says 55, but what's really there is CC. That's the breakpoint. Then when you hit run, it will put the 55 back there and carry on. So that's how it works. It's really very simple. Of course, that means if you do something in your code, like an integrity check, where you calculate the hash value and decide if it's been altered, you can detect that you're in a debugger. And that's why Android malware will not run in, in emulated environments. There are many ways to do it. And you know, there are various you might mess up the program execution. It's very rare, but this trick might impact the program execution. Is CC hexadecimal for stop? Yeah, CC is um, just the code for a int3, which is the particular exception that goes to a debugger. And we'll talk, there's a whole bunch of interrupts. If you have to, if you, How does the program know that you're in the debugger? It would know because it could just, for example, take the hexadecimal value of everything and run it and calculate the MD5 to see if the program has been modified. This is what a lot of Android apps do. And if there's a breakpoint, it's no longer going to pass that test because this no longer has 55. It really has CC. But the, you are at that breakpoint. Uh, it's not running out of code. That's true. Um, you're right. So you might be able to stop it from running the verification routine. It would depend on when it runs it. You're right. Yes, well, it's, you're right. It's a good point. While it's broken, you might not catch it. It would have to be in another thread or something. This is a good point. All right. Anyway, um, all right, so there are, in case you don't want to use the software execution breakpoints, which is all I've ever used and all you normally use, but if you don't want to use those for whatever reason, there are hardware execution breakpoints. There are special registers just for this purpose, the debug registers, which will define addresses. Nothing is modified at all, but the processor knows when it reaches that address, break. This is how you debug code without modifying it at all, um, and that's that's another way to go, but there are only four of them in hardware, so you can only have four breakpoints at a time. And uh, so the inside the CPU? yeah, inside the CPU, it's provided in the CPU for this purpose. Yeah. And so now, of course, this means, however, your running code could change those registers to cancel them. So if you wanted to have anti-debugging in your malware, you could nuke those breakpoints. And therefore, they put a defense in what the seven register here, which will cause another breakpoint prior to any move instruction that would change the debug register, but it only detects move instructions changing them, and you can use other instructions to change them. So this is the way all defenses are. You have a weakness, somebody exploits it, you build a defense, somebody builds a better gun. You build a better shield, they build a better gun. It's never going to stop. That's the way it is. So anyway, um, then there are conditional breakpoints, a feature of your debugger. Now what this does is, it's gonna break only if a condition is true. So you wanna break on this function, but only if a certain parameter is being passed. So instead of breaking every time you hit that instruction, check and see what parameters are coming in and only break if a certain parameter is being passed in. The way it does that, of course, is it puts on a normal software breakpoint, then every time it hits, in the Python code of the debugger, it checks to see if that value is there, and if it's the wrong value, it hits run for you and goes on. So it slows down your program. It has to stop execution, go to the slow Python, check the condition, and then it run again. But it will have the effect of only breaking if that condition is true, but it will slow down your code. And it will keep doing that in order to find that specific right. part of the uh, code. That's right. So you can, um, yeah. So this is, there's an example in your textbook where they're trying to detect for the poison ivy rootkit, with an old rootkit, and they put a flag on the uh, function that reserves memory, but only if it's reserving a big block of memory, more than 100 bytes. And that's one the kind of thing you can do. And there's yeah. so many different ways to do it. To, uh, now, uh, in the recent, uh, with Python 3, you can do it so many different ways. Oh, sure. You can do it with well, all different ways. Now, all that we're using is based on Python 2.7, actually. But, it, but that's because it's old. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, they, but you can, you, you know, you can do anything. You can even write your own Python extensions to it, and a lot of people do. And we'll use some of them later. All right. At least one of them. All right. So that's conditional breakpoints. Therefore, it takes longer. It has to really execute your code and go into slow Python and come back. So it can slow things down, 
but normally it's all right. So let's take a look at another Kahoot, which will uh, be somewhere here. Yeah. Santa Rosa 4.4. Oh, the, okay. Oh, the earthquake. Yeah, it was an earthquake. Oh, not this one. I'm yep. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, well, that was the last one. 1906 was the big one here. Yeah, yeah. Well, 4.6, it probably rattled some dishes in Santa Rosa, but we're getting just a tiny bit of it here. Patreon and Neural Security Team. Yeah, there can be a lot. There's a bunch of people now looking for jobs. There's a bunch of people now looking for jobs from Patreon, of course. No, probably not. It's probably just a joke, but the fact is those people are on the market now. And uh, I think some people, now that they know why they quit, I think some people might look favorably upon them, saying, you appear to be a good guy. <laughs> for a while, we were all wondering if they did something terrible, and that's why they all got fired. Now it appears to be the opposite. <laughs> The whole security team of Patreon quit like last week with no explanation. And now the explanation has come out. Patreon has been facilitating a sexual exploitation of minors. And they quit for that reason. The parents will set up accounts for children and then take Patreon money to watch the pornographic images. And Patreon said that made it legal. And the whole security staff said, that does not make it legal, I'm leaving. <laughs> And I think they're right. That does not make it legal. Patreon is going to have big legal trouble if this is true, and it appears to be true. Oh, yeah, that's a federal crime. Oh, yeah, but you go to jail for 20 years. That's, that's, you that's trafficking a minor. Oh, it is. It is. Oh, and, and, and Epstein. Yeah. Yeah, and Epstein got away with it for an awful long time. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. But I don't think Patreon's going to get away with it. <laughs> All right. So what does interrupt number three do? That's your standard software execution breakpoint. Okay. So when you try to execute the instruction at that address, it will break out. All right, what kind of breakpoint might slow down your program? Breakpoint. Yep, because it has to leave your code and go calculate a condition in a slower language. All right, what's the most common breakpoint? Yep, software execution, only kind I've ever used. All right. And which one might cause you to miss important functionality? That's step over because you execute all the subroutine and you don't see what happens inside there. All right. All right. So honey's one again. I think I know from a previous class who Wood is. Alright, good. So, uh, I see it is 10 minutes to 7, so let's take a 10 minute break.